Hey everyone and welcome back to the bench build. Uh, right now I'm not going to be building, doing any building on the bench. I'm going to talk about lessons learned. Some things that uh, I just I, I jotted down a bunch of stuff that I you know learned lessons I learned building the bench and the, during the process. Um, I was going to wait till the end to do this, but why not shoot it now? Um, I know there are a couple people out there that are building a specific bench or a very similar bench that are following the Paul Sellers method or uh, the style that Wrangler Star made. Mine's kind of an incorporation of both styles. Um, so yeah, hopefully, you know, the this this little uh, lessons learned session will help you in your build. <clears throat> um, so number one, keep your plane iron sharp at all times. Uh, if you start to feel your plane iron going dull, pull it out real quick and drop it about 50 to 100 times. Uh, a lot of times, that will, for me, a lot of times that will take care of it. It'll put a nice sharp edge right back on it and I can get back into business. Uh, <clears throat> I'll usually do that throughout the day. I'll strop it throughout the day. And then at the end of the day, I'll sharpen everything and have everything ready to go for the next morning. <clears throat> but keep your plain iron sharp. Uh, number two, the pull stroke. Um, this was really the first time I'd ever pull, done a, used a pull stroke where I, where I had to do a pull stroke exclusively. Um, the bitch is so big that it's too awkward to push left-handed through because all my grain goes this way. So when I'm on that side of the bench planing the top of this uh, top of this top, uh, I'm over here and I'm playing. And I mean, obviously, I can't plane right-handed like that's too far. Um, I guess I could, but that'd be a little weird. So if I'm on that side of the bench, I can plane left-handed, but left-handed. Outreach like that is just too much. So it just made more sense to, you know, picture it from the other way to pull it. And I did it outside when I was doing the tops and I, I'm doing it in here now. <clears throat> and it just makes so much more sense. It's so much cleaner. So don't give up on the pull stroke. Don't count it out. It's, uh, it's nice. It really is. Um, <clears throat> Number three, uh, gluing up. One lesson I learned, uh, well, to cut to the chase, I wouldn't use the Paul Sellers method. I'll probably never use it again. Nothing against it. It, it does it work? Obviously, it does. He used it. <clears throat> he used it. You know, he's been using it for 50 years. And, um, and he's a world-class carpenter, so, I mean, I just, I personally, I didn't like not having, not knowing that I didn't have full coverage on my board. So from now on, I will be uh, putting lots of glue on and spreading it out. And if I'm doing something like this, I might, you know, get it all on there, spread it out, and still do a perimeter bead, just to know that... Uh, I have enough glue that's going to get, you know, that my perimeter is good to go. And then I'm going to have enough squeeze out to where uh, I don't have gaps in between any of my boards. Uh, thankfully, all my boards, with the exception of one little gap right up in here that you can't see, um, with the exception of that one little gap, both planks came out great, amazing. Um, there was more gap, there were more gaps, but as you plane them down, uh, the gaps disappear. So, <clears throat> so if you just glued up your tops and you have gaps, don't worry about it. <laughs> Most of them are going to come out when you plane the tops down. <clears throat> um, this was huge for me, and I got lucky with one, and uh, I thought about it on the second. <clears throat> Or maybe I did know about it before the first, but 
when you're planing each one of these boards, <clears throat> make sure that you align all of the grain in the same direction, right? So imagine if I glued these up and I didn't know which way the grain was going on the edges. <clears throat> and I had to, I had, air, like, every other board was opposite grain direction. It would be a nightmare trying to plane this whole plank as one board if it has eight different directions of grain on it. So, <clears throat> they never talked about that in either one of the videos. I think it's safe to say I would sacrifice uh, prettiness on the top. As you can see, I have knots. Um, I got some pretty good knots too, but you know, who cares? I'll work around the knots. <clears throat> um, but I would, I would, uh, I would, I would give up uh, the pretty side for a proper grain direction. Chances are the other side's just fine too. So, <clears throat> just uh, and you can do. I mean, and I don't mean the pretty side. But if you wanted to have a, like, if you wanted this knot, right, down here, now you got to suffer with it down here because you flipped the board around. Well, whatever. <clears throat> you can also flip the board the other way, but a lot of times you don't have that, that luxury because you chose that board to be on that side because maybe there was waning or something on the other side. It was a big chip out or whatever. <clears throat> um... But, yeah, make sure, make sure, make sure that all of your grain direction is going in the same direction. And I would also do the same thing I did. And when you go to glue your tops on and everything, get everything to where, right, so this, <clears throat> both of I mean, you can do it or not. It would probably be easier if you had, like, I didn't think about it until recently, but... <clears throat> Being right-handed, I probably would have put the grain direction going this way on the back and that way on the front. That way I could plain push through if I wanted to on all of my boards. So that's a little something to think about. Um, uh, and don't, think, don't forget, like when you do your aprons, <clears throat> when you do your aprons, glue. Make sure you know which mark, which way the grain's going, and uh, make sure you glue them up to where the, when they're one board, their their grain is like one board too. Um, <clears throat> flattening a long timber, <clears throat> or making sure that it's flat all the way across the top, right? Uh, one of two ways, right? Either use a chalk line uh, and go to the chalk line, or get yourself an eight foot ruler right from or an eight foot level, or however long your bench is. If it's five feet, get a, a five or six foot level. Get a level longer than your bench from the get go. Don't do like I did and wait and. Put yourself through a bunch of agony and stuff trying to figure out how to do it without one. Just just bite the bullet and buy a damn level. <clears throat> I wish I, I kick myself every day. I wish I would have bought an eight foot level two months ago. Um, but the string line, the string line works if that's all you got. If you can't afford a level or whatever right now. Uh, I get it. I, I totally get it. <clears throat> um, Borrow, borrow one from somebody or use a snap line, a uh, chalk line, <clears throat> and just snap a line and, and plane to it. Uh, just be careful and use your brain. Uh, so when you're doing large timbers, I put a video out. It's um, It has the, the most views out of all of them. I think it's probably close to, uh, I don't know, it'll... It'll change every day, I guess. Uh, there's hundreds of views, though, on it, on uh, how I cut a large timber successfully. I didn't learn that until halfway through this series. <laughs> and um, hopefully, 
hopefully that has benefited a lot of people. Um, and that is basically, in a nutshell, you have a timber, you're going to mark and score, uh, well don't mark, it's, it's the same thing, but score your line all the way across three sides or four if you care about the bottom. Uh, give yourself a little uh, curve, a little shelf to sit your saw in with a chisel and then roll through where you can see your line start sawing through the timber and then once you get a flat line straight across and you're following your line down the down the side go to the other side where you're con where you have control over where your saw goes in reference to your line so saw Right, so say you're doing this way, you're going to saw down this way and then go to the other saw side and saw down this way. That way, uh, the part of the saw where the control is, your hand, is able to follow the line on either side. Anyway, watch the video, it'll make more sense. <clears throat> um, but that will save you a ton of time uh, from having to... Uh, do a whole lot of planing and and stuff like that on the ends to get all of your pieces, whether it's legs or bench tops or aprons or whatever, to length, to their final length. <coughs> uh, spoke shave works great on end grain, on shaving end grain. Nice, that was a great tip. Uh, treat every board separately. Right, so even though even though I, I milled up and I was making this top, which is essentially one piece that is 11 and a half by whatever it ends up being, four and five eighths, um, I still had to treat each and every board the same, right? So you mill it four square, <clears throat> cut it to length, mill four square, make sure there's no twist, it's all flat all the way across, uh, and all that stuff to each and every board. If you do that, <clears throat> if you do that, then everything comes together much easier. If not, then you're gonna be chasing your tail halfway through um, that section of the build, like, uh, you know, if you're doing the tops, let's say. Uh, so we treat each one like it's its own board. <clears throat> um, something I learned and I passed it on to one guy today. If you're going to, something that you may have thought um, I, I don't know how you're going to how you're going to build your bench. I didn't realize it was going to take me two or two and a half freaking months to build this sucker. <clears throat> but I'm only working on the weeks, uh, weekends, and, and at night after work. So, and that's not every single day. So it's taken me two and a half months to get to this point, and that's a lot of that's still a lot of work in that two and a half months. I mean. <clears throat> I busted my ass building this bench. Um, but what I'm getting at is if you are going to buy all of the lumber that it is going to require to build this bench, know that if you are building it in at night and on the weekends, <clears throat> know that it's not going to happen in a few days or in a week, right? Keeping that in mind, as if you have your wood all laid out, hopefully you have a lot more room than I do. <clears throat> um, keep your wood on a flat surface and sticker it, and put weights just like you were, just like you were milling your own lumber, or you bought a bunch of lumber for a project and uh, whatever, and you were just letting it dry and <clears throat> season your wood. Um, <clears throat> st 
sticker your wood. Sticker your wood, sticker your wood, sticker your wood. If you don't, you're going to be paying for it in hours and hours of labor down the road. Because you're going to lay it all on the ground, or you're going to have it all up on some sawhorses like it came out of the stack like that. And you're going to think you're good to go. Oh, it's only going to take me, you know, so much time to 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 um, to build this bench. And then before you know it, you're finally getting to your legs a month later, <clears throat> and you go to grab your boards. You go to grab your uh, your lumber for the legs or the aprons or whatever. And it's all twisted and bowed and cupped and you name it. So sticker your wood in the middle. Don't pull the wood out of the sticker stack until you're ready to use it. Um... Check your edge joints from both sides. I didn't have this problem, I just wanted to mention it, but check your edge joints from both sides. When you go to glue up your apron, uh, your aprons, or if you're joining two pieces of wood together for your well board or whatever, when you join two pieces, to, you know, two uh, edges together, make sure you're checking on the top and on the bottom to make sure that the seam uh, is indeed even though you did four square all the way around both sides both boards you may have a little bit of uh, inconsistency somewhere along the board <clears throat> and you want to make sure that you give it a sanity check from the top and the bottom or from both sides uh, check thickness frequently on long boards um, something that you may not be thinking about, but you need to pay attention to. It's one of those, like, nobody thinks about it because it's so far gone, right? When you're dealing with something <clears throat> that is this thick and this long and this wide as some, one of these tabletop or these bench top planks, you, you have a lot of things that you have to worry about. Is there a twist? Is there a wave, right? I didn't think about the wave until later on uh, in the project, which you all saw. But so you got to make sure that it's, you know, not cupping or uh, crowning or any or bowing or anything like that. Make sure there's no twist. It's all flat, no waves. <clears throat> But if you're not sitting on level ground, you're not going to notice this last little aspect, right? Until you mount everything and you go to check and you're like, what the hell, right? But you have to make sure that eventually, and sooner or later, your bench top thicknesses have to be the same everywhere, right? They don't have to be, but... Um, that's definitely the goal, right? <clears throat> you don't want to have a bench top that is, what I'm getting at is one end might be this thick and it tapers down to that thick at the other end. That's a little exaggerated, but if you are not paying attention to it, there's absolutely no way to know that you're tapering from one end of the one end of the the top to the other unless you measure it. You're not going to see it with your level. You're not going to see it while you're checking for flatness or while you're checking for twist or while you're you know planing. Nothing is going to tell you that there's a taper except for you. You rough out and smooth out one side, get everything nice and perfect on the on one side now that's your bottom then you flip it over and everything all your measurements need to come off of the bottom right so you get all the get it all flat and get the twist and everything out of with no waves off the bottom that becomes your face your face uh, <clears throat> 
sword I'm looking for. Anyways, that's become that becomes your face. It gets your face marked. <clears throat> when you are doing this, if you don't use that surface, right? So, okay, forget what I uh, where I was going, but get the bottom or get that one surface perfect, as perfect as you can. Then flip it over and everything goes off of that one face. <clears throat> um, and then, well, you wouldn't flip it over. You would flip it up on end and get one of these edges done. That'll be your face edge. Once you have those two surfaces, then, you know, now you're treating it as one, as one large board. And then you can go from there. Just don't forget to check your thicknesses. If you're roughing out the top, you may be roughing out, you know, more over on this end and then less over here and not even realize it. Um, and you're not going to know it. And last, I mean, you could be perfectly flat, no twist and everything, but it's at an angle and you just, you won't know it. So measure, just you get a tape measure and measure both ends to make sure they're the same thickness. All right, moving on, dang. Um... Oh, feather your plane up. I couldn't tell if it was, it could have been two different things I was talking about. So when you plane, you plane and then, so that you, if you were to just pull back, you would leave a little snipe there, a little uncut piece of uh, shaving or whatever. So go down and as you, as you exit the cut, you want to lift your heel up. Or you can lift the whole plane up, but the whole the plane has to leave that plane iron, that cutting edge has to leave the surface, or you're gonna leave a mark or a shaving or something still attached to the wood. That's not you don't want that. So <clears throat> and then also you when you sharpen, you want to make sure that you want to make sure that you rock up on the corners. If you have a completely square blade iron. When you plane, it will leave those marks in your board. More so than if you put little wing, little wings on the corners. Watch my sharpening video, uh, my <clears throat> one of my sharpening videos, um, to know what I'm talking about with uh, with that. Uh, oh, that was the next thing. So, and it all starts out right. I think I showed this in one of my other videos, but, and this is kind of, I was kind of doodling around as I was making whatever, but, uh, it started out just kind of as a random sketch, and <clears throat> I know it's not perfect, but whatever, it doesn't matter, I'm not an artiste. Uh, so, something that I had thought about when you're doing when you're doing uh, the laminations <clears throat> for these tops um, you have the way that I did it I planed all four sides I planed all four sides before I laminated them together uh, and this kind of goes against what I one thing I said in the beginning but it may, if you choose good flat boards and there's no bow in them, no, no, uh, they're, they're good flat, it's good flat lumber. If you get good flat lumber, straight lumber, as straight as you can get it, it's probably going to end up being closer to the dimension you want when you're doing your lamination than if you start planing the edges. Just a thought. You may want to uh, plane the size, the six-inch side, or the you know the face, the faces of of the board, and leave the and then laminate it with the bull noses still on the edges. Those are all going to come off when you you're going to plane those off anyway, right? 
Um, just a, that's just a thought. <clears throat> uh, that probably would have saved me a lot of time if I just planed them all down uh, at the end. Just a thought. You can do it any way you want. This way obviously worked. Uh, it just took a lot longer. Mm. Uh, I have I have a, a note here to go over the tools that I used. Well, I'll go over that at the very end because that's that's a, a video all on its own. Um, <laughs> lesson learned right so this is my poor man's router uh, make sure that your cutter is straight in there just like mine is uh, if it's cocked to one angle one side or the other it's going to be not the whole length of the cutting edge is not going to be flat against the board but <clears throat> Guess what I didn't do? I made this a long time ago. Well, not a long time ago, but relatively. Uh, I made this um, well before I started the bench build. And... <laughs> what I didn't realize is that I needed to check it before I used it. And... Once I once I realized it halfway through cutting some of my um, my tenons, that there was twist, there was twist in the uh, in the board, so I had to take it out and finish it up. Every, uh, thankfully, everything turned out just fine, but that was a rookie mistake. Uh, you know, your tool if you're using wood. Damn it. If you're using tools that are made out of wood, you have to realize that it's made out of wood. And that wood is going to react to, you know, it's going to relieve its the stresses in itself and it's going to warp twist and bow and cup and everything else on you. So make sure that you just check. I mean, after once it, once it dries out and becomes stable, that's great. Once it's milled and it's stable and dry and everything, it usually isn't going to. It's not going to to twist or anything. <clears throat> Have any stress relieving that's going to be detrimental to your work. But you always want to you want to check it. Just like these guys, if I'm going to use these as, as straight edges and as winding sticks, I need to check them periodically to make sure that they are still flat and true and everything like that. Because these little things are, I mean, I made mine pretty thick, but they're still relatively thin, you know. I mean, these guys can warp. Now, they were made out of, uh, you know, dry lumber. Or dry dry wood, but they can still they can still settle after they've been you know once you mill away wood, the stress relieving process starts all over. Um, no matter how small it is, it's happening. Uh, <clears throat> so check your tools if they're made out of wood. Uh, Okay, something else, and this is kind of tricky, but if you're lucky enough, right, uh, I would, when you laminate boards together, you want to, something I have noticed, you want to, uh, to try <clears throat> to get it where, and I'll just kind of try and, um, cause my boards aren't like that and I kind of, we, me and a buddy of mine kind of thought of this after the fact, but if you're going to, if you're going to have a board like that and a board, you know, you're going to laminate these sections together. 
then you're going to you're going to want to try to get it where these boards are you know because most likely they're going to be plain sawn right so you get the grain like that and then the next one you want to alternate and you just keep on changing it keep alternating it like that because if you get if you do it and they're all going in the same direction then that whole piece is going to relieve in that same direction right <clears throat> hope that made sense <laughs> if you're going to counter bore for say a screw head or bolt head do the counter bore first do the counter bore first I'm not going to explain that uh, just do the counter bore first and then do your through hole. If you do make a boneheaded mistake like I did and drill your through hole first, you can do what I do and did and just throw a throw a plug in it and like a you know shave a shave down a dowel or something or a plug and and fill the hole up and that'll give you something to bite into as you cut your. Uh, <laughs> as you cut your counter bore. Remove wedge keepers. I have no idea what I meant by that. Remove wedge keepers. Oh! <laughs> on the I know I forget I, I haven't been under the bench in a while so I forget um, and I can see them too but your wedges when you go to glue the top to the aprons make sure that you remove your I, I, I cover my wedge I keep my wedges in because it's I guess you wouldn't have to but I, I wanted everything to be rock solid bolted wedged clamped everything was gonna be perfect when I did my glue up right so I left my wedges in there and I just I put some paper towels up on top of them so that the glue wouldn't run down and run and, and glue my damn wedges to the bench but um, what I did do and I was thankful that I did do was I, I unscrewed the keepers from the, that hold the wedges in place. Uh, I removed those when I did the glue up. <clears throat> uh, the wedges were in there tight. They didn't need the keeper right then and I didn't want to glue that into it either. So remove, uh, remove the keepers and cover the wedges. Only a few things left. Uh, ensure all joints are square, at least close enough to where you are happy with it before you bolt up. Okay, so I'm talking, when I wrote this, I was talking about the, you know, making sure that all of your joints, the bench is racked square or that it is square and not racked one side or the other. Or that it's towed out or towed in. Um, make sure that everything is good and right. And don't be afraid to go back and do a little rework to make sure that everything is done exactly the way you wanted it to be. You know, if you were, say, towed out, if your bench was towed out like this because you cut your dado housings wrong, well, go back in. And you've already made your wedges, you've made every, your benches together, you're ready to glue up and you're checking for square and you realize that it's like this. Well then go in and cut these housing dados wider and just go cut some wide ass wedges. But get it, get it right. Get it right because you're going to be working with this bench for the rest of your life. Or a, a good portion of it. 
Um, oh, something else. <clears throat> I wouldn't have gone with six by six legs. Uh, if I had to do this over again, I would not have gone with six by six legs. And the reason for that is, even if you get number one stock, the best lumber you can get, if you get it in six by six, I don't know why, but I and I see it. I've seen this all over my side of the my my you know city, my area, anywhere within a hundred miles of here. <clears throat> if I go into a lumber a lumber yard. The four by sixes are going to be a whole lot clearer, <clears throat> meaning <clears throat> knots and checks and cracks and defects in the wood. Um, your four by sixes are going to be a whole lot clearer, almost vertical grain uh, for the most part. Uh, and your six by sixes are going to be full of knots and checks and cracks and this and that that you have to work or plan around and. Because when you're laying out a board, you know, like my legs, you know, I got eight foot long, uh, I got them eight foot long, eight foot long, uh, six by six, and six by sixes, and um, I got two of them, and I'm cutting four legs out of this sucker, out of these two timbers, and <clears throat> trying to um, determine where I want to cut like the sections I want to cut out of this uh, this eight foot six by six was a long it was a long process because I had to like once I mean once you make the cut that's the cut and you're dealt with you're you're that's it you know you're not gonna go run out to the lumber yard again and buy a whole another six by six those aren't cheap um so make sure you know exactly what you're doing and where you you know what what is the placement you know say if I cut you know you have a six by six laying here eight foot long if I cut this you know you know what your length is already because you already figured out what your bench bench height is going to be so say I wanted to cut it you know 34 inches long. Where is that 34 inches going to come from? Because 34 inches between here and 34 inches here, that might put, that's the difference of putting a huge knot right in the middle of where you're going to be trying to chop your mortise. Um, so I marked, I knew where I was going to, going to put my, my stretchers. So I knew where my mortises were going to be chopped. And so I just looked at where, and I tried to cut a length. I think mine were 31 and a half inches long. I tried to cut my length to where I had the clearest wood possible for chopping mortises. Because, uh, I mean, the last thing you want is to try and chop through a huge knot in the middle of your mortise. <clears throat> uh, sometimes you can't avoid it. But I was able to, for 90% of it, not have to chop through mortises or chop the mortises through a, through a huge knot or anything like that. Um, so alleviate all that and go out and get four by sixes. Six by sixes are overkill to begin with. You don't even need four by sixes. You could do four by fours and you'd be just fine. I wanted. To, I knew this was going to be a heavy ass bench, and I wanted something that would support it. And four by sixes would be just fine. If I was building this again, I would have gone with four by sixes. They're a lot clearer and a lot less stressful. Um, before you start, or as soon as you can, before you use the planes that you're going to be working the bench with. Make sure that you make sure your planes have been restored. Your blades are sharp. Your plane iron is sharp. You know your handles are tight. Your 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 plane. You know how to set up a plane so that you're cutting evenly on both sides of the plane iron. Make sure that your soles are flat. Um, 
make sure that everything works properly, your frog is adjusted correctly, all that stuff. You got to make sure all that stuff is good and true and right before uh, before you go planing down all your boards. Um, you're gonna make your life miserable if if you if you like don't know how to set up a plane. You're like, you know, your whole board goes like this, where your plane is cutting to the right, you know. Uh, cutting deeper on the and it'll make your life a living hell on edges <laughs> if you're not set up correctly. <clears throat> You'll wonder why you're always dipping to the right. Um, think I mean that's the end of my list. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of things that you could probably get from my videos that I didn't mention here that were maybe less important or whatever, but. Um, those are the main things. Um, there's a lot of little things that you learn during this build. I learned a ton during this build. And I've acquired a few, like any project, I've acquired a few, a few new tools. Uh, I got my levels, uh, I got my drill bits and my saws, but those were, uh, well, two more saws anyway, but those were kind of gifts. I didn't need them for the build, but um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> do you need a whole lot to build this bench? Realistically, no. And how long is this video? 42 minutes? Screw it. Let's, uh, <clears throat> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop this and I'm going to make another video shorter on what tools I used uh, to build this bench. So far, anyway. So, I'll stop this one now. Uh, I'll get it live and I'll start shooting the other video. So, friends and family, I love you. Everyone else, I'll see you soon.